Miriam. I am Joe Lalamia, president of the Texas Astronomical Society. And tonight we're going to try to find out how astronomers measure distances. And some upcoming events. Astronomy Day is May 26th from 3 to 10 p.m. right here. So weather permitting, we'll have solar scopes during the daytime, and then we'll transition into regular nighttime observing after dark. And some activities going on inside the planetarium at the same time. Saturday, May 26th. Uh, at that time, the uh, subject will be the past, present, and future of the universe. I intend to be here for the future. <coughs> okay, here we go. Some example distances, because there's many people that don't. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many times at star parties we get the question, how far away is the moon? Okay, the general public really doesn't have any idea about astronomical distances, even to objects that uh, most of us kind of take for granted, like the moon, you know, is 250,000 miles away. And I guarantee you, if you ask some young people now, how long did it take for us to get to the moon, they won't be able to tell you three days. Okay, which is how long it took the Apollo astronauts to travel to the moon. It's three days, three day trip. See? <laughs> on the, on uh, the past ones, does it still take that long, no matter yeah, how you get there? Yeah, uh, escape velocity. It has to do with escape velocity. Orbital velocity is about 17,500 miles per hour. So you got to go that fast to get into orbit. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's technology's changed since then. You're yeah. always the same. At 25,000 miles an hour, you escape the Earth's gravity. Oh, okay. So uh, it just takes that long to get there. And they orbited a few times, you know, before they kicked in and actually went across. So they didn't just rocket away, you know. They spent some time in orbit. The sun, of course, is 93 million miles. And this is a very, uh, I don't want to say unique, but it's a number that we use to designate big distances. And that number is AU, astronomical unit, which is the distance from the Earth to the sun, is one astronomical unit. So, if I said Jupiter is 5.5 astronomical units away from the sun, you could very quickly calculate how far away from the sun Jupiter is compared to the Earth is one, of course. So, within the solar system, we use a term called astronomical units, and they're all based off the distance from the Earth to the sun. So Saturn, you know, it's like 9.8 astronomical units. Pluto, if I remember right, is 39 astronomical units, something like that. Nearest star, 4.2 light years. And again, they use the term light years for longer distances that things that are outside the solar system, because the numbers are so big that if we wrote them down or even tried to say them, they probably wouldn't make much sense because the closest star is tw about 25 trillion miles away, okay, which is not Alpha Centauri. Proxima Centauri. Not. Really? Is that what it is? Is that what it is? That's the name of the star system the Alpha Centauri star okay. system. Alpha Centauri There's three A, stars there. And Proxima Centauri is closer than the other two. I thought it was 
So Proxima Centauri is the closest star. It's 4.2 light years away. Okay, so light travels about, about, well, it's 5.8 trillion miles a year, but if you just remember the number six, so, you know, just in rough numbers, light travels six trillion miles a year. So if somebody says, oh, well, that's 100 light years away, you can, in your mind, real quickly, 600 trillion miles. All right? So that's another measurement that astronomers use all the time, a light year. Again, it's a measure of distance, not time. It's a measure of distance, not time. And we're a long way away from the center of the Milky Way. About 26,000 light years. So what we're also saying is, if you look at the, toward it, the center of the Milky Way galaxy in a telescope, which you couldn't do in a visual telescope because there's too much dust and debris between here and there, but assuming you could, you would see it as it was 26,000 years ago because it took that light that long to get here. So I like to tell people uh, telescopes are time machines. So when we show you the Andromeda galaxy at 2.5 uh, million light years away, you're actually seeing it as it was 2.5 million years ago. Okay, because it took those photons left there they spent two and a half trillion years moving across space. They hit the front of the telescope. They came through the tube and hit your eye. Okay? Mm -hmm. And Andromeda is the closest full normal galaxy to us. There are some other dwarf galaxies that are closer, like the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds. Those are much closer, but those are dwarf, little dwarf galaxies. Andromeda is a spiral galaxy, very similar to the Milky Way, about 2.5 trillion million light years away. And way, way out there is what's called the cosmic microwave background at 45 billion light years distant. Okay? 45 billion light years. I just distant. can't fathom that number. Oh, well, ne neither can anybody else. And that's why they use light years. Because you would have to multiply that times 6 trillion. <laughs> And the number would be, wouldn't make any sense. Okay. It took the microwaves 45 billion light years to get here. Now, <clears throat> I want you to challenge me on that number right now. Why should you challenge me on that number? Microwaves weren't around? Don't no, they say no. the universe is 13.7? billion years old. Oh. Well, how could it be 45? Microwaves travel slow? No, the universe has been expanding since the day it was made. And it's now expanded out to that distance. It's a calculation. So we're not at the edge of the universe. Pardon? It's because we're not at the edge of the universe. So there is no edge. There is no center. Space expanded. Think of it like uh, Bill and I are standing on a sidewalk. We're not moving. And the sidewalk does this. And we move further apart. Okay, but we didn't actually move, the space between us moved. And we're just along <laughs> for the ride. All right? 
That's confusing. <laughs> okay? So the reason that's a 45 is that the universe is only 13.7 billion years old, but it's been expanding for 13 billion years. Okay? So now the estimate is that that background radiation is out there at 45 billion light years. There will be things that far out we will never see because the light will never reach us in order for us to see it. Then, then how do we know the cause of the Because we can effect? see this. We okay. can see this. All right, but there could be things beyond that which we will never see because the light will never reach us in time. All right? It'll never get here because the, the outer extents of the universe are expanding at the speed of light. Okay? Come on and sit down. No problem. So the, the furthest places that we see, the further out we look, the faster the expansion. The further out we look in the universe, the faster it's expanding. So when we look at the furthest reaches, they're expanding at the speed of light. So anything beyond that would never reach us. It'll never reach us here where we are. So we'll never see it. Okay? I'm not going to try to catch you up, but there's some distances for you. Just in case you didn't know it, the moon's that far, the sun is that far, the nearest star, the center of, the, of our galaxy, the nearest regular galaxy, mm -hmm. and the cosmic microwave background is out there at about 45 billion light years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we guessed. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, we guess. <coughs> There's several ways that astronomers have of measuring distance in the universe, and it depends on what, what distances are we talking about. Are we talking about from here to the sun? Are we talking about from here to the near stars? Are we talking about from here to Andromeda Galaxy? Different measurements are used for different distances, okay? Some of them overlap, so we've been able to check several methods to see if we get the same number, okay? Some of them overlap. So for closer objects, <laughs> we use trigonometry, okay? Just plain old trigonometry. And, you know, we can... You've seen the guys on the side of the road with the transit, you know, and, they're and another guy's down the road with a stick, and he's making him move that stick around. They're measuring distance using trigonometry and that little telescope he's looking through. Like that. Okay, so you can use trigonometry uh, plain old trigonometry to measure some stellar distances, but not real far, but some of them can be me measured with trig. <coughs> Parallax. I want you to put your finger in front of you like this, right between your nose, and open and close your eyes, you know, back and forth, and your finger will move back and forth. Your finger moves because of your eyes, the distance of your eyes. That's called parallax. All right? Parallax. All right? Your eyes are this far apart, and your finger moves back and forth. You see that? That's called parallax. And it's the apparent change in position of an object due to a change in, in your position. That's all it is. And they... There's my example that I just gave you of, you know, your right eye, your left eye. 
in astronomy, parallax is the angle of the apparent change in position of an object due to a change in the position of the observer. Well, let me give you an example. <coughs> it's June the 1st. We go to an observatory and we take a picture of a star that's 1,000 light years away. Six months later, July, August, September, October, November, December, we take another picture of that star. We've just used the orbit of the Earth as the base of the parallax. We compare those two images and see how much it moved, just like your finger did. And we can calculate how far away that star is, up to about 3,000 light years. Then the angle gets so small, you can't see any movement. But out to about 3,000 light years, you can just take a picture and look at it. Parallax. Parallax is a combination of two words, and I know you've heard of parsecs on Star Trek. You know, when Chekhov says, well, there are four parsecs away from us. Right? I get a kick out of that. <coughs> a parsec is 3.26 light years. That's what it is. All right? So, one arc second of parallax movement equals one parsec. All right, so if it moves one arc second, it's 3.26 light years away. That's the measurement. So when Chekhov says that, now you know what he means, see? Uh, so if he said there are four parsecs away, there are about 13 light years <laughs> away from us. I always got a kick out of that. So parsec is a combination of the words parallax and arc second. Parsec. Okay, that's what that means. Parallax and arc second. <laughs> uh, okay, well, <clears throat> you can use it even to determine where the moon is. It's not that. We can use a laser and just bounce it off the moon and tell how far away it is, all right? But you can also use the moon and observe some stars behind it and tell how far away the moon is. Same kind of way. So, all right. And, you know, we can bounce lasers off of the moon. All right. That, that's one of the re things I use when people uh, run into, you know, there's about 20% of the population that believes we never went to the moon at least 20%. And one of the things I use to say, well, how did those laser reflectors get down there on the surface pointed directly at Earth? Because uh, several of the missions had these little mirrors that they physically set on the ground and pointed toward Earth, and then that, that's what we're using to bounce those lasers off of. Okay, so I always say, well, how did those reflectors, did uh, Captain Kirk beam them down there, or what did he do? All right, so they can never explain, the ones that don't believe, how they got there. You know, well, they got there because the astronauts put them there. And they had to physically point them directly at the Earth and line them up, you know. And that's what we use to bounce lasers off of. You can do parallax during an eclipse. Okay? But we're not really that smart. Because this guy did it in 280 BC. 
right. He actually measured the distance to the sun before Christ, B.C. Right. And so that's an old technique. And again, for stars, you know, we're looking at the angle. And the angle of change. And you can even do it with background galaxies or quasars or anything that's bright. And you can actually get this angle and get a distance to this other object. Again, it's just trigonometry. That's all it is. So it even applies to more distant things than normally you would think about. And there's that star moving, see? How it would move around if you took those pictures. It's hard to do because of the Earth's atmosphere, but as you know, we're outside the Earth's atmosphere now with the Hubble and everything. So we don't have to worry about turbulence in the atmosphere messing up the movement because they're measuring real precise little movements you know it's not like some big movement it's like a tiny change in the position of some of these stars and if you got a lot of turbulence that you're looking through that's going to affect the measurement you won't be able to measure it as precisely And, you know, we've already covered that. A small and near star moves less than hair's width and arm's length, one arc second in six months. And, of course, now that we have spacecraft, you know, that can do this from outer space, they can get real precise measurements. Real, real precise measurements using parallax, which is just trigonometry, to reach out there and measure a bunch of stars. Again, it's kind of limited out to about 3,000 light years, all right? Because then the angle gets so tiny that they can't measure it. But they were able to do this. Okay? With some of that satellite data. So they have really good measurements for a whole bunch of things. Real precise measurements. Real precise. Alright? Okay, what do you do when it's way out there? They gotta use some other techniques. <coughs> and yeah, okay. Y'all missed it, but we're 26,000 light years to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So 3,000 light years isn't quite all the way there. So we use something called the Cepheid Variable Star. Now there's a bunch of these out there in the galaxy and in other galaxies. And what they are is a star that varies in in intensity of light. Uh, some of them as quickly as a day or so or hours. It'll be very bright and then it'll dim and then it'll get bright and then it'll dim and then it'll get bright over and over again. Certain time lengths like Old Faithful and Yellowstone. You know, this star varies from ma maximum to minimum in 2.5 days something like that. Those are called Cepheid variables. And <clears throat> they're actually all over the Milky Way and they're all over other galaxies. So once we knew the standard candle power of that a Cepheid variable, the standard candle, which has a direct relationship to its change in luminosity and the period of change, how quickly it does it. You can calculate a standard luminance for that star. In other words, it's a 100 watt light bulb. 
They're all 100 watt light bulbs. Once I can do that, once I know that a separate variable, of course the original ones we could check with trigonometry to see if it was right, right? <laughs> which they were. All right. So once we know that a separate variable shines at 100 watts, or whatever that is, we can tell how far away it is by its luminance. Okay, so the example would be if I had a 100 watt light bulb in my hand and you knew it was 100 watts and I started walking away from you, the light would get dimmer and dimmer, wouldn't it? But you could actually calculate from the brightness of that light how far away I was from you because you knew it was 100 watts. Same thing, exactly the same thing. So they know the standard candle of a separate variable. So whenever they see them, they know the period of change in brightness, how long. And they can calculate the standard candle and they can tell how far away it is. So now let's go through the slides. This happened in 1908. This lady right here discovered a consistent relationship between average Cepheid luminosity and pulsation duration. All right? For any level of luminosity, the apparent brightness decreases consistently with distance, according to that formula. If an object uh, moves twice as far away, it appears four times dimmer. So they can calculate how far away it is by the brightness. And again, there was they already knew of some that they had used parallax to find. So they had an exact measurement already of using trigonometry of how far away that star was. So they could double check themselves. That's how they did it back in the early 1900s to make sure they were right. Standard candles, knowing the pulsation duration, you know the actual luminosity of that star and you can make that calculation. <coughs> they didn't just find them in the Milky Way, they found them in other galaxies, all right, that were outside our own. So now they knew they could take a run at how far away is that galaxy by trying to find separate variables within other galaxies, okay? This is kind of like the intermediate step when you're stepping out into the universe, okay? So now we've got a way to measure the nearby galaxies, quote, nearby. Mm -hmm. Okay? Quote, nearby. All right? And again, by measuring their apparent brightness, she was able to determine the distances of those stars and thus to the small and large Magellanic clouds which are some dwarf galaxies that aren't very far away from us. So basically they saw some varying stars inside the galaxy there they were looking at and they watched it and made the calculation. <coughs> Meanwhile, in 1923, Edmund Hubble used separate variables in a number of large galaxies to establish their distance. We're fixing to go into redshift and all of that now in a minute. And the expansion of the universe. So here we go. He further showed that the further away those galaxies were, the faster they were moving away from us. And that the universe was expanding. He used separate variables to do that. And we named the telescope after him. And here we 
go in the red chip, which is the next step. All right? One of the next step. There's one more we're going to talk about. <coughs> red chip. Let's see how we can do this. Real simple. Everybody's heard a jet plane go by or a train or, you know, a train comes and goes, mm, it's high and then slow, right? Yeah. Why does it do that? Why, why is it high here and low over here? Because of light waves. No. Light waves. Why, though? The Doppler effect. It's called the Doppler effect. What does that mean? Sound waves get more distant when it goes away. When they're coming toward you, they're compressed. When they're going away from you, they're stretched. Okay. The Doppler effect. Light does the exact same thing. Light that's coming toward you is compressed into the blue part of the spectrum. Light that's going away from you is stretched into the red part of the spectrum exactly like sound is okay so so <coughs> so when we look at distant galaxies and they're red shifted there is a calculation we can do to tell you look at the spectra the light and you say, oh boy, it shifted here, and you do a calculation, and you can tell how far away it is and how fast it's moving, too. Both, okay? By how much it shifted in the spectrum. It's called a Z factor, all right? in mathematics. So you can look that up on Google. Just look up redshift Z factor. You'll see this formula on how they calculate it based on the shift of the of the light in the spectrum. So here we are again with Cepheid variables and they're good out to about a hundred million light years, all right? then it gets so far away that either we can't see them anymore, we can't tell they're varying, or it's not enough information for us to do a calculation. To go beyond that, there's another way to do it with something called a Type 1A supernova. Remember this, there was a 14-year-old girl six months ago, eight months ago, that spotted a supernova in M81, in the galaxy M81. She was like 14 years old. She just happened to be looking at the right spot at the right time. <laughs> and she reported it, and lo and behold, everybody else jumped on it, and they gave her credit for finding it, you know. But what it is, is uh, a binary star system <clears throat> has two components and one of them happens to be a supergiant red supergiant star and the other one is a real small dwarf star white dwarf star what will happen is the white dwarf will begin in some cases will begin sucking off part of the gases from the supergiant and they're falling on the surface of this uh, dwarf star and what happens is it, the dwarf which basically goes critical when so much mass falls onto its surface the, the dwarf goes critical and it explodes mm -hmm. and it explodes with a standard candle light and there you go again, just like the Cepheid variables, every time they can spot a type 1a supernova explosion in another galaxy, or in our galaxy, they can measure the distance by observing it by the brightness. 
because those dwarfs explode with the same luminosity. A hundred watt light bulb you get. Okay? So depending on the distance, they'll use separate variables or type 1A supernova. And of course they have to have a type 1A supernova event in order for you to measure it. So the type 1A supernovas get us out, you know, about 3 billion light years. You've got to see one and be able to measure it before you can estimate the distance to that galaxy. And you might have heard of something called the uh, Hubble constant or Einstein's constant, you know, or Einstein's number that he wasn't sure of, you know, and all that. He thought it was a mistake and all that. You might read about that someday. But anyway, uh, the measurements now show fairly accurately at about 125 miles per hour per 1,000 light years. That's the expansion rate. Okay? Obviously, the further out you go, the faster. That's per 1,000 light years. If I threw the number 300 billion in there, or 300 million in there, you'd have to do a bunch of multiplication, wouldn't you? <laughs> All right. That's why the furthest ones are traveling at the speed of light. The furthest ones that we see. So the expansion rate, the further out we look, that number keeps, you know, at that rate, the expansion gets faster and faster and faster. The further out we look. Again, remember I said telescopes were time machines. And I said that, you know, if you're looking at Andromeda at 2.5 million light years away, you're actually looking at it as it was 2.5 million years ago. All right, so by looking within the 3 billion light years that type 1A supernovas uh, distances, we can see that changes in the expansion rate over time have occurred. You know, you measure here, then you measure here, then you measure here, then you measure there. You're getting closer and closer to yourself, and the rate changes. Okay? That tells us that over time, the expansion rate has accelerated. And the red shifts do the same thing further out. So, <clears throat> always get the question when we say at star parties that will always be asked, how do you know that star is 1,500 light years away? How do you know that? Okay, so one way is trigonometry, as we discussed. Parallax to a certain distance out, about 3,000 light years. Separate variables, out about that far. Type 1A uh, supernova, out to about 3 billion light years. And then redshift beyond that. And those are the measurements that astronomers use to measure distances. And depending on the distance is which method they'll use. Hello, what happened? Okay. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, Bob Lowe actually did this presentation and he posts them 
posts all of his classes at that site. Sites, google.com site, Robert Lowe. But I'm going to give you another site. All you got to do is go to uh, vimeo.com forward slash channels forward slash TAS T-A-S Okay? And we post all the classes there for the last three years. And a bunch of other stuff. Okay? So vimeo.com forward slash channels forward slash TAS T-A-S And he gets a lot of information off of uh, Wikipedia. Ooh, yeah. There's our club website, texasastro.org, and you're welcome to look around the site. Look up in the top, and you're going to see some newsletters and stuff you can read and things like that off of the site. Can you tell me that website is Say again. The other website. The one oh, Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo.com forward slash channels. Like a TV channel. Mm -hmm. Forward slash TAS. T A S. Texas Astronomical uh, Vimeo is V I M E O. M -E -O. Vimeo.com. That's it. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Off of how you measure distances. A little bit more clearer now. Mm. So if I said type 1A supernova, you know what I'm talking about? That dwarf, that blue eye? What that? that super red? They use Einstein's uh, constant, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not quite sure. Remember, he didn't know if he was right or not either. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the one that is denominated as H? H zero. Yeah. The one if you divide it by the momentum you can get the wavelength. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh -huh. But it, the number has been changing. You know, it always changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. What I posted up there, because I've read some different numbers than that 125. Mm -hmm. I've read anywhere from 90 to 140. As far as miles, you know, miles per hour per thousand light years, yeah. So it, it's kind of in a range. That's kind of the middle of the range, 125. But I don't think they'll ever get it perfectly accurate. You know, they may get real close, but they're never going to be able to say you know, this number. Mm -hmm. it, exactly what happens to the white? after it explodes into a supernova again? No, it explodes. Just one time? Yeah. But I thought white dwarfs, white dwarfs were the cause of regular stars going into supernova. Well, remember, it would have been a binary star system to start with. Okay, so there's bunches of those. Bunch of binary star systems. One of those stars becomes a super red giant. The other one, the other one is become a regular star system. Yeah, and it just shrinks up. Now it starts sucking in the red giant stuff. So it already starts as a dead, dead star. Dead star. Got it. Yeah. So and it, then it, just, it just goes back into becoming When it gets a enough star. mass onto the surface, it can't handle that, and it goes critical and blows up. And exactly, it becomes back into a white trap. No, it's back. exploded. It, it doesn't <laughs> It's finished. <laughs> it's done with. I didn't go in. There's another type of type 1A supernova, and there's another type of Cepheid variable. But basically, it's the same idea. There's a type 2 Cepheid, Cepheid variable, but it's an older star with metal, more metal in the spectrum. It's the same idea.